On September 21st, 1998, the sitcom Will and Grace premiered on NBC in the United States. Focusing on the friendship between a gay lawyer and a straight interior designer, the show was one of the first with gay protagonists to reach mainstream success in the US. Even though the main character of Will was portrayed by a heterosexual actor, the portrayal of Jack by Sean Hayes and the role of Max Muchnick in creating the show was a step forward for LGBTQ individuals having some say in how their narratives were presented on TV. That being said, not everyone was a fan of how the show portrayed queer people. One of the biggest long-standing criticisms of the series is that it presents LGBTQ lives within a heteronormative lens. For starters, let's define what that means. Heteronormativity is the assumption that heterosexuality is the default, preferred, normal state for human beings because of the belief that people fall into one or other category of a strict gender binary. In modern interpretations of heteronormativity, many choose to refer to it as cis-heteronormativity. Not only is heterosexuality largely considered the default, but so is being cisgender or being comfortable with your assigned gender at birth. Heteronormativity is not just a belief, but a construct. For example, the institution of marriage is largely viewed as a heteronormative one due to the fact that the notion of marriage in the United States results from religious beliefs surrounding cisgender, heterosexual couples. Though gay marriage is also legal in the US, many would argue that the structure was not created with LGBT people in mind, but that they were superimposed on the concept as an afterthought. Inaccurate and outdated understandings of gender also fall under heteronormativity. Gender is far more nuanced than a binary, but a binary is the way that gender has been understood within quote-unquote traditional colonialist and cis heterosexual relationships. Media also carries many of these stereotypes. For all intents and purposes, the original Will and Grace was a traditional sitcom that had gay people superimposed onto it. The main character of Will was a gay man and very much represented what a gay man might look like, but it was only one example of that. This of course doesn't mean that he was or is any less gay, but the whole trope of him being a perfectly normal sitcom character aside from his sexuality involves a heteronormative precedent. When you have a side character like Jack whose main purpose is to be comic relief as a more effeminate gay guy, it feels like a binary. Either gay people fit in with heteronormative society as quote unquote normal people, or they don't. As the case of Will and Grace suggests, the mere presence of gay characters on broadcast television does not necessarily represent a challenge to the dominant norms of US culture. This phenomenon of LGBTQ people being superimposed onto heteronormative values is often referred to as homonormativity. This is not to mean that LGBTQ people who fit within heteronormative values aren't a part of the community, but that their validation isn't dependent on queer people being accepted by society, but instead cherry-picked, based on which identities and lifestyles are easiest to assimilate into the mainstream. This might seem like a petty thing to point out with regards to media, but the phenomenon does have real-world consequences. For example, transgender activists Sylvia Rivera spent a lot of her time campaigning for gay and trans individuals in the 70s, but found herself disrespected by cis people once their freedoms were acquired. And the gay rights bill, as far as I'm concerned, you know, to me, the gay rights bill and the people that I worked with on the gay rights bill and when I did the petitioning and whatnot, when the bill was passed, that bill was mine, as far as I'm concerned. I helped word it and I worked very hard for it. And that's why I get upset when I give interviews and whatever, because the fucking community has no respect for the people that really did it. Drag queen did it. We did it. We did it for our own brothers and sisters. But damn it, don't keep shoving us in the fucking back and stabbing us in the back. And, and that's what really hurts. And it's very upsetting. And when we asked the community to help us, there was nobody to help us. We were nothing. We were nothing. When you have movies like Stonewall come out that create fictional narratives of historical events because they depend on acceptance from cisgender heterosexual audiences, the implications of homonormativity and heteronormativity become personal. You have to understand one thing. I didn't make this movie only for gay people, I made it also for straight people. I kind of found out in the testing process that actually, for straight people, the main character, Danny, is a very easy in. Danny's very straight acting. He gets mistreated because of that. Straight audiences can feel for him. Heteronormativity has also influenced music. For example, a majority of American pop music from the last 100 years is about subjects and relationships that are assumed to be heterosexual. As LGBTQ individuals start to have more influence on how their narratives are portrayed, there is still a lingering atmosphere of marketing any new LGBTQ perspectives in relationship to heteronormative ones. In a similar way, many artists and art explicitly about being queer are sometimes equated with countercultural artistic movements on the sole basis that they present non-normative identities 
identities and lifestyles. Having artistic control over mainstream narratives has historically been a white, heterosexual, cisgender thing. I also want to emphasize that this dynamic has also been intersectional, meaning that race has always factored into how people were and are able to present themselves. The lack of queer representation is why 20th century LGBTQ people more often than not had to see themselves in other people's art before they could have proper representation. Like I've spoken about in the past, art forms like musical theater provided a proxy through which many people could express themselves while also being able to have some role in heteronormative society. This is also why musical theater is able to represent a simplistic, cheesy art form within heteronormative culture while also being a liberating, groundbreaking thing for queer culture. So of course Disney also plays a role in this. As a company that has been working with a variety of mediums since the early 20th century, Disney has not only influenced American all-ages entertainment, but also family values in the country. Watching Disney films is a rite of passage, while going to a Disney park has been largely accepted as a typical upper-middle class vacation since Disneyland opened in 1955. However, this image of American values and American entertainment is largely a white, cishet construct. A majority of relationships present in Disney films and at the theme parks echo these heteronormative ideals, leaving little room for other groups to see themselves. But yet, every day, more and more LGBTQ people are introduced to Disney films, imposing heteronormative concepts onto them before they have the vocabulary to identify as anything else. So let's talk about where those people fit into all of this. One, two, three, three, to be on the move, to go for a hike or whatever you like to do. On June 1st, 2019, the first Disney Paris Pride Party was held at the Walt Disney Studios Park. Originally called Magical Pride Celebrating Diversity, the event allowed visitors to enter the park from 8pm to 2am and ride attractions, meet characters, listen to live music performances, and even take part in a Magical March of Diversity parade that featured a Tanya Kelly remix of the Cinderella song So This Is Love. The event was the first Disney-affiliated LGBTQ-themed event to happen at a Disney park. However, this event didn't just appear out of nowhere. The idea of having an LGBTQ-themed party at a Disney park wouldn't have been possible without decades of unofficial events and pressure from inside and outside of the Disney company. Since its opening, the idea of Disneyland has always been that it is a theme park with entertainment and attractions curated by the Disney company. However, the park soon began to rent itself out to other organizations, provided that the organizations and causes were considered on brand for Disney. In 1978, there were some LGBTQ business owners in Southern California who wanted to rent out Disneyland for a day, but knew that the largely conservative company would likely not be interested. In order to keep a low profile, they founded the Greater Los Angeles Restaurant and Bar Association to create the reservation under. By the time Disney had realized who made the booking, it was too late. The party happened anyway, but Disney had increased supervision and security to watch over it. The day after the party, Disney also sent apology letters to the cast members who worked the event. However, that wouldn't be the last time that LGBTQ people inserted themselves into Disneyland. The 80s saw Disneyland deal with same-sex dancing in Tomorrowland, resulting in a lawsuit in which the court forced Disney to allow the two men involved to dance. This didn't mean that Disney lifted their same-sex dancing ban, though. Instead, they asserted that it only applied to the two people involved. With the opening of its teen nightclub Videopolis, though, Disneyland would quietly lift the ban on same-sex dancing. However, they asserted that this had nothing to do with the LGBTQ community, instead pushing the narrative that shy teenagers shouldn't have to dance with the opposite sex if they don't feel comfortable doing so. After another same-sex dancing lawsuit, Disney continued to loosen how they monitored same-sex interactions interactions within their parks. The relationship between Disney and LGBTQ people continued to develop in the late 80s. Not only was the notion of occupying space at theme parks brought into question with the aforementioned dancing controversies, but some form of representation was also beginning to seep its way into the company's entertainment. With the 1989 film The Little Mermaid, not only was a direct tie to musical theater re-established thanks to involvement from Howard Ashman, but deliberate queer coding was made through the character of Ursula the Sea Witch, specifically resembling the drag queen Divine. In 1991, the first Gay Day at a Disney park would happen, organized by Doug Swallow in Orlando, Florida. Originally wanting to organize just a fun event where LGBTQ people wore red shirts to recognize each other, they chose a not very crowded weekend in June to have the meetup. It started out as a small gathering, but grew exponentially once local outlets and venues began spreading the word. There aren't exact numbers as to how many people appeared on the first Gay Day on June 1st, 1991, but it's estimated to have been between 1,000 and 3,000 people. Though since 1990, 
1987, the concept has expanded to renting out the water park Typhoon Lagoon. The main event has always been LGBTQ people simply showing up to Walt Disney World in red shirts, with other events being held at neighboring venues. Since the first gay day in 1991, the event has expanded to a multi-day celebration that attracts people from all over the world. Disneyland in California also has their own version of gay days that happens in October, allowing multiple opportunities for people to participate. However, this doesn't mean that the event grew organically with little pushback. Disney's public acknowledgement of the LGBTQ community in the 90s was mostly neutral, neither condoning nor condemning it. Though Disney as a company began providing health insurance benefits for same-sex partnerships in the mid-90s, their public persona remained neutral in what looked to many like an attempt to not upset the large conservative portion of their fan base. Disney had stopped people from organizing at its parks before, so its quiet allowance of gay days appeared to be a subtle thumbs up to the practice. However, this centrist view of the issue did not satisfy the LGBTQ community or queerphobic groups. Many queer individuals were upset that Disney would not take a stronger stance on making LGBTQ people feel welcome while queerphobic groups such as the Southern Baptist Convention and One Million Moms criticized the company for allowing LGBTQ individuals to intrude on a family-friendly space. And that tension never really ended. Though gay days at both Disney World and Disneyland have persisted and only grown since their original incarnations, there is still so much queerphobic vitriol lobbed both at the company and the individuals who take part in those events. It's not uncommon to see threads and websites helping people plan around the gay days, spreading rumors and false stereotypical information about the gays tarnishing the family values of Disney. As someone interested in queer history, it's impossible for me to separate those bad faith criticisms from the extensive historical precedent for LGBTQ individuals to not only be seen as threats to society, but also be labeled as morally depraved. And Disney had remained largely neutral on the issue until last year's Disneyland Paris Pride celebration. Despite being a company that is considered friendly to LGBTQ individuals with regards to internal policies, Disney seems afraid about being too candid about gay rights, possibly in fear of losing their conservative fan base. However, in recent years, they've been easing into it. Disney has begun introducing official merchandise that references LGBTQ individuals and pride symbols. Even though it feels awkward that the merchandise itself doesn't explicitly mention pride, it's undoubtedly a progression from nothing to begin with. Last year even saw the Disneyland Resort introduce Gay Day's specific food. Of course it wasn't labeled as that by the company, but people got the message when rainbow themed snacks rolled out exclusively for the weekend that Gay Days took up space at the resort. Like I spoke about two videos ago, the notion of representation within the Disney company is also evolving from its queerphobic origins. With things like the recent Pixar short Out, LGBTQ people are being given creative control over their own narratives, giving hope to an otherwise neutral situation. But that's only one part of Disney's relationship to the LGBTQ community. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, more and more queer people are being introduced to Disney entertainment on a daily basis, whether or not the company wants to acknowledge it. Even within the company's current representation, the acknowledgement of LGBTQ identities has largely been within a homonormative context. The gay people in shows and movies are no different from their peers aside from their sexualities, allowing them to blend into a heteronormative society. So what happens then? Well, it depends on the person. In our current environment, there are many people who grew up alongside Disney and learned about themselves in relationship to Disney media. As someone who grew up as a non-binary person in the United States, I understand this feeling well. To greatly enjoy something, to gain so much self-understanding from it, but not see yourself in it. The thing is, LGBTQ people have always been involved with Disney, regardless of any outward standpoint. If you've watched my channel, you've undoubtedly seen my videos about that subject, tracing how the LGBTQ community is actually very much related to the entertainment that Disney makes. Queer people have also read themselves into situations and movies that were not explicitly intended for them, showing the power the community has to carve spaces for itself within heteronormative society. To learn more about this dynamic, I spoke with my friend Kyle Frank about the notion of assimilation and what it means to create a space in a society that isn't built for us. I don't know, I feel like a lot of these, a lot of things that bring people joy when you're queer can also be really tainted with like a history of trauma or like not fitting in those like ostracizing feelings. I just feel yeah, like even further from cis heteronormativity. It's a good thing to me to feel like I am furthering myself away from this boxed in culture. Like, I feel like I'm growing into myself, but that there's not as much for me to grab onto in this. Like, I still now, if I, you know, going into a bar or a public space, it does feel kind of hard to break through my anxiety in order to be, like, self-confident in a space like that and not feel like I don't belong. As someone who is queer, who also lives in a capitalist society, who is also incredibly anxious, 
I find a lot of comfort and stability. And I think that's reflected in the capitalist society in which we live in, where stability oh, yeah. is viewed as success in a way. And I think ultimately, though, that goes kind of against what I as a queer person experience. Because if I learned anything about being gay or being non-binary, it's that literally nothing about it is stable in the way that I want a lot of things to be as a result of being anxious. But learning to kind of understand that and kind of appreciate that and learn from it and not feel threatened by the complexity of my emotions and feelings and gender has been a journey in itself. And I think that's probably the power of communities, especially the queer community. Those things in the context of a heteronormative capitalist society, they may seem not stable, but all you need is just to be surrounded by people who feel similar things to understand that that is stability. Yeah, I really relate to what you're saying about security, especially in our society. I mean, I think a function of making safe spaces for queer people to come together and foster community does inherently hold space also for grief and sadness. The grief that we experience, you know, being ostracized from the very places that we've grown up and lived in. As we grow into our queer selves, realizing that building a community it takes a lot, a lot of work to seek out and find like-minded people because a lot of us like-minded queer people are pushed back into corners where we may not be feeling comfortable to make those connections. I know I definitely feel that a lot. I don't want to expose myself. Even just like being publicly seen as queer gives me a lot of anxiety. And it's heartbreaking because I see other people on the street and in, in the world living and being, you know, visibly beautifully queer. And I see them and I'm like, I want them to see me too. Too, but I'm not showing myself as much as I could be. And that's why queer specific safe spaces are really important. Um, and it's why connection and community is important because if I'm not taking the steps myself, you know, I might need someone's help to pull me into the conversation. I mean, I feel like in heteronormativity here in America and, and stemming from colonization, there's a big disconnect from our feelings. And a lot of people are afraid of what would happen if we took more effort and time to express our feelings, talk about our feelings and process them, to share them with others. And I think that is specifically where queer people are doing a lot of work in their artistry of expressing feelings. We've gotten pretty far into this video without talking much about music. That was intentional. I think to understand music's place in the Disney experience, it's necessary to understand the history and concepts I've highlighted in this video. But make no mistake, music is an essential part of the Disney experience. In many situations, music provides provides a foundation for stories and narratives. Music introduces emotion to words and phrases. With music, taking a walk through a park becomes a dreamy sequence, waiting for your life to begin becomes a manifesto, and dreaming about your ambitions makes them feel achievable and larger than life. Music at the Disney parks is also essential to the experience. Whether you have music underscoring a ride, providing an anthem for a parade, or highlighting sentiments in a fireworks show, empathizing with Disney music is almost a prerequisite to enjoying the whole experience. Music not only provides an in to enjoying entertainment, but it also also allows us to project our own experiences onto it. Disney music echoes this accessibility by embodying many tropes and musical concepts largely associated with pop music. Music is also essential to many different facets of LGBTQ culture. Clubs, discos, and cabaret shows are just a few examples of places where people could and can congregate without fear of prejudice, allowing communities to flourish alongside developing art forms. I feel like my relationship to Disney growing up was similar to LGBTQ people who have empathized with heterosexual divas throughout history. No, I didn't see myself in the work but the emotions that the work spoke about and incited in me became a catalyst for other personal discoveries. It's always a funny thing to describe to somebody on the outside the complicated relationship that many LGBTQ people have with Disney media. Many people assume that Disney is a conservative, bourgeois company, and therefore it's become the LGBTQ equivalent of being an equestrian. However, I think the relationship that Disney people have to Disney is something that can be seen all throughout heteronormative society. When you force people into a position to empathize with something that doesn't empathize with them, the connections begin to form in ways you'd never expect. So where do we go from here? Well, many places. Things like the first official Disneyland Paris Pride are great steps forward for providing representation and safe spaces for LGBTQ individuals within the theme parks. It's also worth noting that even having spaces carved out for LGBTQ people within otherwise conservative public spaces is already a huge feat that has taken decades of activism from the community. As we push for better representation, it's important to also acknowledge and remember our history. But I don't want homonormativity. I don't want to see LGBTQ people superimposed onto heteronormativity as a starting point. 
I would much rather reconstruct the system. I would much rather create stories and music that are about us and don't require structures of heteronormativity to function. As long as we live in a society that marginalizes LGBTQ people, events like gay days will be a necessity for everyone to feel welcome. I don't have any issue with that. In fact, I want Disney to embrace them and even partner with them to make their intentions more explicit. If Disney wants to make money off of guests coming for gay days, they should label their merchandise and food appropriately to at the very least make their stance clear. Clear. Adding authentic and empowering stories about LGBTQ individuals is another way that they can provide space for those who do not have official space within the Disney experience. At the end of the day though, I'm not interested in going to Disney during gay days. When I grew up dreaming about going to Disney someday with someone I love, I didn't want to go during a special time that's reserved for me. I wanted to go at any time of the year like everyone else and not feel limited. I recognize that attitude isn't something that's safe for everyone. Queer representation is a very nuanced thing, and I recognize that I have privilege both in being a white person and the fact that most people read me as a cis, gay man. That's why I think gay days are important. They provide a safe place for people to not have to worry. What I think is most important is to not provide a single solution for a better queer future. If we want to move forward, we'll have to accommodate and listen, understanding that what works for one might not work for others. My husband and I went to Disney World in Florida earlier this year for our honeymoon. It was our first time doing the whole experience together. We didn't have to sleep in a friend's closet to save on hotel prices, and we didn't have to get up at the crack of dawn to drive four hours to make it to the park on time. Instead, we were on property at the Dolphin Hotel like many other visitors. As a non-binary person in an intergenerational relationship in which we're living on different continents, nothing about our relationship is quote-unquote traditional. There are situations where that has become unsafe for us and we've adjusted accordingly, putting our safety above all else, but there are also moments where we just have fun with it. Even if we do exactly what cisgender heterosexual people do, it will be inherently transgressive, so why even try to fit in? Being gay in that context becomes fun. As John and I asked a photo pass photographer to take a photo of me kissing John on the cheek in front of Cinderella Castle, we joked about how many families likely had to comment or have a conversation about what they just saw. In those moments, I didn't worry about whether or not we were welcome in that environment. We just showed up and took our space. Based on the incredibly kind cast members who wished us a happy honeymoon and made our time there wonderful, it makes me think that we were welcome after all, even if corporate wasn't explicit about that yet. On the day we arrived, I texted a good friend and told them that I finally felt like a Disney princess. Of course, there are no non-binary Disney princesses, but that's not what I meant. That feeling of being loved and having a place to be loved in felt like a tangible concept, even if I had to create it for myself. As we were walking out of the Magic Kingdom for the last time with ice creams in hand, John and I stopped by Jim Omohundro, the pianist at Casey's Corner who plays music for visitors. As I was talking with Jim about the piano he was playing and looking at the inside of it, he noted our honeymoon pins. He then got up, announced that we had just gotten married, and then sat down and began playing Mendelssohn's Wedding March before bursting into a rendition of Always. In that moment, I wasn't thinking about homonormativity or queer theory or how I would continue to argue for my LGBTQ politics in a world that inherently rejects them. Instead, I was thinking about where I was, at a place and in a moment, that I had always dreamed about being in. <laughs> This is love. Mm -hmm. So this is love. So this is what makes life divine. I'm all the glow. The key to all heaven is mine. wings and I can fly I'll touch every star in the sky 
So this is the 